Zeit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ross Patterson Revolution. Brought to you by BlackRifleCoffee.com. Welcome to Ross Patterson Revolution. It happened, kids. It happens. If you've been listening to the last uh, handful of episodes, you know I read an article uh, from a guy named Riz Verk. Um, he wrote this book called The Simulation Hypothesis, which is fantastic. And he says that w- there, there's a great possibility, more than 50%, that we are living in a simulated world. Obviously, Jesse's tiny little mind can't wrap her head around something like this. So I was like, I'm, I got to get him on the show. I'm going to hit him up. And he hit me back and he was like, Hey man, I'd I'd love to do the show. I know your show. And I was like, awesome, man. Uh, so I'm going to give him a jangle here in like 15 or or 20 seconds. Um, get him on the horn and talk to him about his book and, uh, and this hypothesis. Cause I find this endlessly fascinating. Um, I don't know what goes on in the world. I don't, I don't, I've never seen God. Uh, I, I can't explain who it is. Uh, no, nor am I shitting on anybody else's beliefs. So whatever you guys believe in, uh, at home, um, none of it's either right or wrong. All I'm trying to find out is, is different things that might be possibilities other than what we're being taught. Um, this simulation hypothesis keeps coming up over and over again in, uh, in strange dinner conversations that I've had with people in, in LA and other cities and everything like, else like that. And when I brought up the mention that I might get, get him on the show, uh, a bunch of you guys who listen at home were like, dude, get him on. This would be unbelievably fascinating. So today we made it happen. Um, I want to give a shout out to Riz before we get started here and I call him because, uh, you know, you listen to a show like this or, or Drinking Bros, the other show that I host, and you could say to yourself, man... There is no fucking way I'm going to get involved with this dude today, <laughs> but he's sport enough. I'm going to call him right now. Uh, again, we're going to talk about the simulation hypothesis that this whole thing, including our show, might be a simulated world. Uh, the video will be on YouTube as well if, if, if you want to check it out as well, but I'm going to call him right now. Yes. Rizwan Verk. How are you, buddy? Uh, doing well. How about yourself? I, look, I am doing amazing. I Look, I had said on a couple podcasts ago, because I read an article about your book, The Simulation Hypothesis, and then I ordered it through Amazon, and it came to my house in less than 36 hours, which is, which is amazing, and we'll get to that in a second. But I, I had read this article on your book, and I was like, man, I've got to read this guy's book and then see if I can get him on the show. And I reached out to you, and, and you got back to me right away. So thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Of course, yeah. Because look, your your new book is called "The Simulation Hypothesis," and to me, this is one of the most fascinating topics, um, or or you know, hypothesis, if you will, that is kind of floating out in the air today. I I'm going to full disclosure. I wouldn't have even considered this as something real or entertained the fact that we w- we might be living in a simulated world if it wasn't for Elon Musk. Right, yeah. So Elon Musk, you know, made a big deal a couple of years ago when he was at the Code Conference. And, you know, he, he made the point, which is the, the video game version of the simulation hypothesis. And there's a bunch of different versions of the argument, which we can talk about later. Yeah. But, you know, he he made the point that 40 years ago we had Pong, as the first widely available video game, it was made by Atari, um, Nolan Bushnell and company, right here in Silicon Valley, which is you know where I am at the moment. Uh, and that was basically two, two, two lines and a dot moving back and forth across the screen. Right. And he says that in 40 years we've come to create full immersive 3D virtual worlds and MMORPGs like World of Warcraft and Fortnite. You know where will we be uh, in another 40 years or 100 years? Uh, and with the rate of advancement in video games, and that's a lot of what I've been doing for the past 10 years, is, is building video games and teaching about video games at MIT and uh, uh, investing in video game companies. You look at that technology and how fast it's advancing, pretty soon it'll be indistinguishable from reality. 
And so Elon Musk is one of the, you know, the, the most high-profile supporters of this theory. Yeah, because b- before him, you know, I, you can go back to like The Matrix, obviously, and things like that. And uh, it's a fun movie script, you know? But it is really hard to wrap your brain around the possibility that, that we might be living in a simulated world, especially with, uh, you know, re- religion so prevalent in uh, not only our nation's history, but every nation's history. Um, there's some form of, of religion behind it. Essentially, if we are living in a simulated world, this almost knocks out the, the, the fact that maybe there is one God. Uh, would you say that's correct? Well, not necessarily. So I was uh, implying that there's different versions of the simulation hypothesis. And I think that, uh, you know, in the most kind of technological, science-oriented version, um, we are basically AI or simulated characters, you know, within a simulated universe on somebody's computer. The big question being, who's that somebody? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Computer. (laughs) Are we on (laughs) to, to spin up a new world? You just need to have more computing power. And, you know, when The Matrix came out, this whole idea was pretty much seen as science fiction. Um, and, but if you look at The Matrix version of, of the simulation hypothesis, in that, I mean, there are AIs or uh, NPCs, as we call them. In the video game world, there's PCs, player characters, and NPCs, who are non-player characters, who are like the, you know, the guys that are helping you along the way and, um, you know, inside the, the role-playing game, uh, but they're controlled by the computer with scripts that are set up beforehand. Um, and in The Matrix, you know, Neo, who's played by Keanu Reeves, takes the, in that very famous scene, taking the red pill or the blue pill from Morpheus, who's played by Lawrence Fishburne, <laughs> yeah. and he wakes up to his real physical self outside the simulation, outside the Matrix. So in that version of the video game uh, simulation hypothesis, we actually exist outside of the video game, and we are controlling our characters. Now, if you remember, in The Matrix, they had this um, uh, wire that was connected into his, his neocortex. Yeah. Uh, probably why they called him Neo now that I think about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, and they were able to beam the signal directly in there, and he forgot about the physical world. So, you know, in, as you look at different religions, and so about a third of my book is about the technology we would need to build The Matrix ourselves. Uh, and it goes over some of the arguments out there. Uh, about a third is about some of the weird findings in quantum physics. And then about a third is about looking at the uh, at the different religions of the world right. and seeing how actually the simulation hypothesis may be a better underlying description for what they have been telling us all along, that maybe we have a soul that is outside this world that comes into the body at birth and leaves at death. Now, depending on which religion you subscribe to, in the Eastern version... That soul comes back again uh, and gets reincarnated into another body, which is kind of like playing multiple video game characters, right? Yeah, it, so, it is. Yeah, so it's it's a question of, you know, I, one of the reasons I think this is such a fascinating topic is it's one of the few frameworks. And, you know, when I was studying uh, computer science at MIT, my professors would always tell me that, you know, what we call science is really a set of models and how we model approximate the real world uh, and if those models are useful, they can help us kind of figure out how things work. And so this is one of the few models that I think people in the science world can buy into and people in the religious world can buy into uh, because, you know, a lot of religions are telling us that this, this physical world is temporary and what we do here is being watched, which is not unlike what happens, you know, with video games today when we have uh, eSports matches. I don't know if, you're, if you've seen any competitive video games. But yeah. It's a, Pretty big business these days. <laughs> Huge. He, he, even uh, ESPN is televising it now. Um, I mean, that's it's, right. It's yeah. become it's become really big business. Yeah, and I think that like the team that won, you know, League of Legends won more money than the team that won the Super Bowl. Or oh something yeah, like that. yeah. So, I mean, and that Ninja guy, he is just raking in money. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember uh, we were talking to his agent in one of my startups. Oh, you were. And, uh, he, uh, so, yeah, well, I think it was represent his agency. And, you know, he gets a lot of money for doing endorsements now, just like... Oh, know, it's, it's insane. Like yeah, Tiger we, Woods. We, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we tried to get him for something. And the, and the quote that they came back with was astronomical. And I was like, this guy just plays video games, right? Um, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but you don't understand. He's beloved around the world. And I was like, oh, man, how do I tell my kids not to play video games when I know how much money this guy is making is, is the hard part that I'm going to have to live with. 
<laughs> yep, that's very true. Well, so in esports, you know, not only are people watching the game, but we're recording the key plays, and then they're showing highlights of it, right? Yep. So it's like this three-dimensional recording. Uh, and I was involved in a startup a few years ago where we would take a recording of, say, you know, these two plays inside, uh, like League of Legends or Counter Strike Global Offensive, where you're shooting another character. And we would basically record it, not on a 2D screen, but in 3D, so you could put on a virtual reality headset, and you could feel like you were inside um, the game, the game. And, and watch these characters like to your left and to your right. <laughs> and so, you know, they provide an interesting metaphor for how we can record what's happening and review those deeds. And it's kind of like what the religions have been telling us all along, <laughs> is that yeah. where's their score being kept based upon what we do here. Um, so, so you know, depending on your 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 inclination, I mean, I've had people who are religious who buy into it, and people that are scientific who buy into it, and then I've had the opposite, right? Some people too far on the the scientific side are like, no, that sounds too much like religion. Simulation hypothesis can't be true. I'm not even going to talk about it. And same thing on the other side. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and it's I'm I'm one of those people uh, like I can open my mind to all kinds of things, right? I, including this, which look for. Most people, I would say 95% of people, they would have a hard time trying to accept something like this, that we're living in fo some form of, of simulation. To me personally, I look around at, at certain things that either I've done or that are happening in the world or you know, awful things that are happening. And I was like, man, I, I really hope this is a simulation at this point because th this shouldn't be going on. I wouldn't do this. Um, <laughs> is, is that kind of where you got started with it? Or was it just purely video games and then going off of that model? Well, for me, it was, you know, a lot of science fiction and a lot of video games, you know. So when I was a kid, I used to play Atari video games. And I would, uh, you know, look at like a racing game and I'd see like the car going around the track. And I'd wonder, you know, what was over the horizon? Like there would be these virtual characters in the bleacher. And I'd wonder, well, is there a city back there? Is there a forest? And, and I'd start to really, you know, ask myself these questions about what was going on inside the game when I wasn't playing. And, of course, back then I didn't know how to build video games, so it, it was all just speculation. But then as I, you know, became a computer programmer and then later a video game entrepreneur, uh, I really started to understand, you know, how these video games are built. Uh, and then I, you know, was watching a lot of Star Trek. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Next Generation episodes where they oh, go yeah. in the holodeck. Yeah. Right? There was yeah. one... <laughs> where uh, the data was playing Sherlock Holmes and the computer was supposed to make the opponent very smart and he made Professor Moriarty, who's Sherlock Holmes' big nemesis, so smart that he figured out some of the people in this holodeck were not holodeck characters. <laughs> they existed outside of that simulation and he wanted to get out of there to see what was there. But of course he couldn't because he was a hologram being projected <laughs> inside the simulation. And so I started to think about things like that, but it wasn't until... You know, more recently, a couple of years ago, when virtual reality became really big, uh, that I started to, to delve into it. I was playing a, a ping pong game in, in VR where I had on the HTC Vive goggles and I had the controller and I could see the table and the reactions were so realistic that I felt like every time I swung my paddle, I was actually hitting a ball and the ball would go to the right place and the opponent would hit it back. It was so realistic that by the end of it, I decided to put the paddle down on the table, and I leaned against the table. But, of course, there was no table. <laughs> there was no paddle. So the paddle was the controller, which fell to the floor, and I almost fell over. But that's how realistic it was. And, you know, it wasn't just about resolution, which is you know, the point that Elon Musk was making. It was also about reactions. Like, that wasn't even a very realistic opponent, but I still felt like I was really there. Uh, and then I would had another experience where I was inside a, a crypt with a giant crevasse to my left with the glasses on, and I found that I couldn't, like, move my foot to the left because I was worried I'd fall down <laughs> into this crevasse, <laughs> which, again, wasn't there. I yeah. was just in a VR room. <laughs> but that really got me thinking. Uh, and then I started to do some research on um, this Oxford professor. We can talk about him in a minute and his simulation argument. But that, that kind of got me, you know, into looking into, into this. And I'd always been interested in consciousness and how we perceive things as well. Uh, let me ask you this. W were you surprised... Um how quickly this, this kind of took off. I mean, I, I saw this, I saw an article about your book on Drudge Report, which n never happens. You know? uh, yeah. I was actually surprised at that. <laughs> I didn't re I didn't realize that uh, Drudge Report had an article, but uh, 
I, I think what happened was I did a couple of interviews, more with tech, um, you know, online tech uh, blogs, because that was where I thought the interest would be. Uh, and then suddenly they got picked up by uh, a bunch of different places around the world that I didn't expect, like Maxim, right? Yeah, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is not a magazine that I would have expected to to write about, you know, simulation theory, but... Um, and so, you know, when people, when one of the articles, they asked me, well, what do you think the percentage is that we're living in a simulation? I said, well, you can't really say for sure. I mean, we're all guessing here, right? Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the reason I wrote the book, and part of the exercise in the book is, how would we build a matrix? So if we could actually build something like the matrix, then it's possible that someone has already built it. And I go through like 10 or 12 technology stages that we need to go through, uh, and starting with text adventure games, which we had, you know, back in the 80s, and uh, 2D adventure games, getting to today's 3D games and VR and AR. Uh, but we're about 50% of the way there. And so, you know, my guess is in another 50 to 100 years, maybe 200 maximum, we could get there. But, you know, I tend to think it's more likely than not that we're in a simulated or computationally based universe. And that's actually one of the themes of the book, Beyond, you know, the video game idea, because you know, some people are like, "Hey, I ain't living in no damn Mario Brothers game." What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's that the, the the physical universe actually has computation and information as its basis. And so I said, because you know, I've kind of looked into this and thought about this, I, I think it's more likely than not. So the percentage I would put, you know, Elon Musk says it's ninety nine point nine 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 percent. <laughs> yeah, he said it's billions to one. Yeah, f- we're not fifty in billion to one. I think he said, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I say it's somewhere between fifty percent and one hundred percent, and that's I think what the, the different press sites picked up on, and that's how the article spread pretty quickly. <laughs> but yeah, I was pretty surprised that it, it spread so quickly because this tends to be an area where you know certain people are interested in it, and other people may not want to think about it. <laughs> well, here's here's the thing that I will say in today's society: uh, science itself has become sexy because of its figures. You have a guy like Elon Musk who's out there. And I, I don't care what, what everybody says about him. He comes off as a really cool guy. I don't know if you know him in real life or not, but in his interviews, the way he talks, his Twitter, like he just seems like a cool guy that he's not, you know, buried away. I listen to some of your interviews um, on other shows and radio shows and all that stuff. You're a really cool, interesting, fascinating guy. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, science is beca- it, it has changed from the figures that are out in public versus what we thought of it, you know, uh, maybe 10 years ago. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I'd say that's probably a fair assessment. I mean, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's science and technology in general has also gotten very cool and I think more integrated into our lives. You know, I mean, there were always you know, people that like to play video games, but now, like you said, with your kids, right? I know my nephews yeah. spend so much time playing Fortnite and games like that, that uh, you know, it's become really a, a part of everyday life. So technology isn't something separate. Whereas before it was, oh yeah, that's the thing those geeks build. Now it's something that everybody kind of uses and is aware of. And I think, you know, between guys like Elon Musk and usage of Facebook and, and uh, you know, Apple and all that, it, it has become much more popular, much more integrated, I think. Yeah. And, and you know, v- video games in particular, when you're playing for money on TV, on ESPN, and it's considered a sport now, and it's, you know, it's got its own separate category of esports. Um, the, uh, to to anybody out there who was like, oh man, I played video games and I was uncool. No, now you're the cool ones. And I mean, the, the <laughs> millions of dollars these these kids are making off of Twitch and everything else. And we talked about Ninja earlier. It's it it, it gets you rethinking what's cool and what's you know popular today. So uh, it's it's incredibly fascinating. Uh, also, the way you yeah. wrote this book is fascinating because look for an MIT scientist, you would expect this to be a clinical. Uh, diagnosis of the simulation hypothesis all the way through. The way you wrote it, though, was very grounded and easy for somebody like like myself to pick up and understand most of the jargon and what was happening in the book, which I really enjoyed about your book. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, my goal was to uh, provide the simulation hypothesis, but to provide enough references you know, to popular culture and to science fiction, which is a lot of what got me interested in this in the first place. Uh, and use those examples when I talk about the technology uh, and hopefully tie it to things we, we've heard about. I mean, one of the stages, you know, is after virtual reality and augmented reality is this idea of uh, light field displays. Now, it's kind of an 
you know, arcane subject in, in, in holograms. But really, it's, it's kind of like creating, you know, the Princess Leia hologram from Star Wars. Right. Uh, but being able to have a hologram that you can look at from all sides. Uh, and with 3D printers, which is something that, you know, I think most people have heard about now, there, you can use 3D printers to print. Yeah, there was a model of an Aston Martin in the latest James Bond movie that was printed with a 3D printer. Right. Some guys in Israel uh, printed a, a, a one-third scale model of a heart with some actual blood vessels using cells. So what that means is what we think of as physical objects are actually uh, can be represented as information, and that's what drives 3D printers, and that's what drives the physical world being able to be represented as 3D models in video games. And so my goal was to kind of show how that touches things we may already be familiar with, and that this isn't such a crazy idea or so far out there uh, as some people first think when they hear it. And they're like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not like, like I said earlier, I'm not in a damn Mario Brothers game. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, look, the Amazon just banned a book uh, where somebody was was giving you the step by step process of how to build a 3D gun. So, right. So, so, so right. They, they pulled right. that down, and, it, and if you can build guns and cars. Congratulations. I mean, we're, we're there. You know, we're, we're really close yeah, to Yeah, and it, it kind of reminds me of Westworld. I don't know if you've seen the oh, show. Oh, yeah. The yeah. You know, at the beginning, they show these 3D printers printing these bones uh, and tissue. And, and today's 3D printers, you know, generally speaking, you use one material. But over time, you can see how more sophisticated 3D printers can print using any different material. And then now you're on your way to building Star Trek's replicators, right? You know? Yeah. They would say, you know, Picard would say, Earl Grey hot, right? <laughs> and it would appear. Uh, and that's because you can represent the cup and the contents of the tea as information, and then you figure out what molecules to use. In fact, a lot of what we think of as biology at its core, I mean, DNA, what is DNA? The people who look into DNA realize it's really a very compact structure for storing information, you know, about the biological organism that that DNA is for, and it's a very efficient mechanism. Uh, and there was a um, there was a famous uh, physicist named John Wheeler who plays a role in a lot of experiments I talk about in the book, and his students came up with parallel universe theories and stuff like that. But he says he was one of the last guys to work with Einstein and some of these other famous physicists. He said physics in his lifetime, and I think he passed away in the 80s, went through three phases. In the first phase, everything was solid. It was an object, like the planets moving around in continuous objects. Everything was a particle. In the second phase, quant they discovered quantum mechanics and realized that there was a lot of probability. So everything was a field of probabilities. Uh, and then in the third phase, he realized that everything was actually information. And he had a, a phrase that he used called it from bit, it being a physical object, bit being the information. And he said, in, in physics, when they keep looking you know, smaller and smaller for matter, they can't find it. Right? Matter is mostly 99.9999% empty space. And as they look in the atom and then they look at the particle, they say, where is the physical object? They can't really seem to find one. <laughs> And so he concluded it was just information, bits of information down at the bottom. And I think that that is, you know, what the simulation hypothesis is really about, is that everything around us is an information constructed reality. So let me, let me what do you think? What's your, what's your guess? Uh, is there somebody behind a computer? Is it ourselves in the future? What do, what do you think, like your personal belief of, of what, what is actually going on in, in this world? Well, so as I said, there's there's these different versions, and, and one of the, the you know really uh, things that drove discussion of this in academia was an Oxford professor named Nick Bostrom, and he wrote a paper in 2003 called "Are You Living in a Computer Simulation?" And in his world, he said that once civilizations got advanced, and in in my book I call it the civilization, uh, sorry, the simulation point at which they can construct a highly realistic simulation like this that they would want to run ancestor simulations. And those ancestor simulations would have lots of simulated beings. Uh, and in, in his, po his point, his argument, which has come to be known as the simulation argument, was there will be way more simulated beings than real beings in the quote-unquote physical world. Therefore, if you are a being, you are more likely to be one of those than one of those. Just simple probability. Right? But in his version... It was kind of like future humans running simulations of their ancestors. And they were mostly AIs. Like the simulation argument kind of implies that we're not necessarily players outside the game. I, I tend to take the, the other view. I mean, personally, 
you know, I've studied a lot of different religious traditions, and I, I wouldn't say that I'm particularly religious, but, you know, I've studied a lot of the mystical traditions, a lot of the Buddhist uh, monks who have really looked into consciousness for thousands of years, and they use the metaphor of the dream. Um, and, you know, when I thought about this metaphor of the dream, so they use it to help you wake up inside a dream and realize that the dream isn't real, that it's simulated, if you will, and there's another you sleeping in bed <laughs> that's outside the dream. And if you can figure that out, if you can realize that, then theoretically, when you're awake, you can also realize that there's another part of you outside of this dream-like world, which is the metaphor that they use. It's a process called dream yoga. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time with those traditions. And so I, I tend to be more along the lines that we are uh, players of a video game and that whoever or whatever is running the video game, you know, it's it's some version of us. Now, there's lots of different theories. It could be aliens, could be, you know, in the Matrix, they were super intelligent machines who were running the Matrix. And they, they needed to run the Matrix to keep the humans occupied. Right. Uh, this was all revealed, like, in the, you know, within the Matrix and its sequels. And, in fact, one thing people don't, don't necessarily realize is that they say the first version of the Matrix they created was where everything was great, uh, it was a blissful existence, and the humans failed to to accept that as a real as a real possibility, uh, and so they had to add you know more realistic elements and make the simulation not so great. Because some people say, well, if this is a simulation, then why is my life so crappy? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that that's that was going to be my next question because a lot of people would ask that of like, man, why am I so stressed out today? If this is a simulation and I'm controlling myself, myself would make me really happy and super rich today. Right, make me a trillionaire, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the most common comment. <laughs> well, it depends on the nature of the game. Like I said earlier, uh, like with The Matrix, if the game is it has no challenges, well, then it's not much of a game. You're going to get bored with it really quickly. And so if you think of a lot of role-playing games today, you know, you choose a character, and this goes back to even before video games, like it goes back to Dungeons & Dragons, right? You would choose a character, and you have different attributes like strength, wisdom, intelligence, charisma, whatever the, the attributes were. You might be an elf or a dwarf or a thief, um, a human, and you, your character would have different strengths and weaknesses. And so in video games today, we have the idea of quests and achievements, and that's what guides you through the game is you have to, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, go get the treasure from the, the map for the Goblin King. And if you didn't have those ach achievements or quests, the game would get really old and really boring really quickly. Yeah. Uh, there there have been games like uh, Second Life, which is a virtual world, you know, from like about 10 years ago. It was pretty popular. And, uh, you know, it, it launched around the same time as World of Warcraft. And it never ended up being anywhere near as popular as World of Warcraft. And one of the reasons why is it was a little too open-ended. Like, you could go in there and do anything, but people didn't know what to do with themselves once they got in there. Uh, but you could live a whole virtual life. You could get married. You could have property and, and houses in the virtual world. Um, but coming back to the idea of quests and achievements, I tend to think that it's kind of like that. And, and this is where it ties to some of the at least the Eastern religious traditions, where we create quests and things for ourselves, and they call it karma, and they keep track of it somewhere outside of the physical rendered world. Now, where is it stored? Cloud servers, perhaps, right? As a technologist and engineer, I like to know, how, how do these things work? Um, that, that, and and that's, so, my, that's my biggest difficulty in trying to wrap my mind around all of this, is how does it work and where does it go, you know? Right, and that's why I like to use the phrase the rendered world, and, and, and so you know that becomes a way for people to kind of understand that like when you're in a video game, the pixels are rendered on your screen, or if you're in a VR headset, you, know, you see it there. But then there's things that the characters inside the game can't see, right? You might have your score, you might bring up your inventory that has a list of things, you might bring up your friends list. Right? Right. There are all these things that you, we can see in, in, in what's often called a HUD or heads-up display you know, within the video game world that are outside the rendered world, uh, and the characters can't necessarily see them. And I think that's the core of, of this idea, is that we live in a world that has 3D pixels. And, and I always wondered about this, you know, whether there is a, a smallest quanta uh, of the physical world. And... There's back in college we used to uh, 
Uh, we used to talk about the, the Zeno's paradox. I don't know if you've heard of that. But, no, you were uh, much smarter than I, and that's that's the reason Jess, Jessie's not here today. She was like, I cannot even talk to a human this smart in my life. Um, she, my <laughs> wife can barely use a computer. She, she was like, you 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 have to take this one. You talk to this guy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Zeno was a Greek philosopher, and he had a bunch of different paradoxes, but the, probably the most famous one is with Achilles and a tortoise. And, and, and he said that if, if the tortoise was ahead of Achilles, Achilles has to get halfway to the tortoise, right, before he can reach him and overtake him. Right. And then he has to get halfway again. And then he has to get halfway again. So no matter how small that distance gets, he still has to always get halfway, so never actually, how can he ever actually reach the tortoise if he's always going halfway and halfway? Now, there's a bunch of different resolutions of this paradox, but one of them is that there is some minimum distance below which you can't go halfway anymore. You have to basically cross it. And in, in physics, they, they refer to the Planck length uh, after Max Planck, who was one of the pioneers in quantum physics, which is that the smallest distance you can actually measure anything. Uh, below that, it's like quantum foam, and you can't really say what's there. Um, and so that is almost like a pixel. Uh, you know, what is a pixel on the screen? You know, you, you, you probably have a Mac or a PC, and it has, I don't know, 1,400 by 1,200 resolution or whatever it yep. is, right? Yeah. So, so a pixel is the, the, min, the minimum amount of addressable space within that, and then usually what shows up in that pixel comes from uh, some information in memory. And so, you know, in memory, I would say this is the RGB color of this pixel and that pixel. Um, and some people have made the argument, well, it would take way too many pixels and way too much information to simulate the entire physical universe. Therefore, the simulation hypothesis can't be right. Like, that's, that's one of the popular arguments out there. Well, you'll, you rarely ever hear a computer scientist saying that because back in the 80s, if you were to ask people, can you render, you know, Fortnite on a Commodore 64? The answer is no, there's not enough processing power. But the history of video games and the history of computer science is all about optimization. How do you optimize? Uh, you know, even like, you know, we watch, we stream Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. One episode of Game of Thrones has way too many pixels to be transferred over a wireless connection, but I can do it. Why can I do it? Because we compress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> optimize. And, and, and I mean, if you, I, I'm with you on that because I like I don't I don't buy into that that uh, theory at all because y y yeah if you can if you can shoot Game of Thrones across the world to you know 15 billion people or however many people are watching that that thing and it and the, the site doesn't crash at HBO I'm I'm pretty sure that somebody could figure out how to build a simulated world you know. <laughs> Right, exactly, because it's all about optimization. I mean, if you're in, in Game of Thrones and you're in the north, north of the wall, right, half the pixels are just white. They're snow, right? So you don't need to have them all rendered. And it turns out the first 3D perspective video game that was really popular was Doom back in the 90s. Uh, and that was the first game where you could actually like, kind of see from the perspective of the, the shooter, mm -hmm. the first where you could see the gun. And if you move to the left or right, all the pixels would shift to the left and right. And, they did a lot of optimization techniques to make that happen. But really, the basic idea is you only render those pixels that can be seen from a particular point of view. So if you're seeing an orc, you don't have to see his back, right? Or you're seeing a giant. <laughs> yeah. You only have to see the pixels in the front. And then you, you can optimize all of those. And that's what video games have all been all about, is, is how to optimize that stuff. Um, and so I think we were talking about, I was talking about pixels and is the world pixelated? And so... Uh, even physicists think that it is. Now, the second question is, is there a time, a minimum time pixel? Like in a in a video game or any computer simulation, you have this idea of clock speed. You know, like you, you have your so many megahertz or uh, gigahertz processors and how many billions of transactions they can do per second. But really, there's a minimum amount of clock speed. And if I'm running a simulation of, say, fruit flies on my computer, you know, this, the the it might be one step per year every time they regenerate. Okay, now there's a million of them. Now there's only half a million because half of them died. Now yeah. there's two million. But each of those is like one step. And that has to be some multiple of the clock speed because that's the smallest amount of time that the computer processor, the CPU, or the GPU uh, can actually work with. And so we don't know yet if there's a minimum quanta of time, but many physicists are starting to suspect there might be because space and time are so well correlated. And, and so they came up with the Planck time, which is how long it takes the speed of light to, to 
to go the length of that little Planck uh, length. Uh, and then, you know, Einstein said the speed of light is fundamental. Like, that's the one thing that doesn't change. Time changes, distance changes. If you're going really fast, like you may have heard of that astronaut, um, Scott Kelly, I think his name was, yeah. who went up for a year uh -huh. and his twin was down here and he came back and he was like a couple minutes younger uh, than his twin. It was relativistic time effects. Uh, but, you know, why is the only constant in our universe the speed of light or the speed of electromagnetic waves? If, if you and I are playing Fortnite, guess what the speed is that we're sending information back and forth? Yeah. Right? It's, that exact, it's that exact same speed. And so there's a lot of suggestions, I would say, within the physical sciences as well that you know, that, that our, our, our world may not be as physical as we think. Yeah, I look, I lean more and more towards it every day. It's not that popular to say out in public because literally everyone looks at you like, oh, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> you're I, right. And that's, I think, maybe why the story, you know, the article you read on Drudge Report probably caught on is because it, it's not that popular to say, even though there are people, you know, that have been saying it for a while. But I think it's, in the consciousness now, video games are understood, but when we talk about the simulation, and, and in the book I call it the great simulation, which is what we think of as our physical world, that is to today's video games what today's video games like Fortnite and World of Warcraft are to Pac-Man, right? Yeah. There's just an order of magnitude difference in complexity and the number of people that are playing. Um, there was a video game made a couple years ago called No Man's Sky. I, I don't know if you, you heard of it. But it was popular because it had one of the biggest virtual worlds. They had 18 quintillion planets in the oh, world. Oh, boy. Now, I'm sure the team that made it didn't sit there and create all the, you know, the look and feel of 18 quintillion planets. There's no way they could have. They used something called procedural generation, uh, which is a lot like fractal algorithms, so that, you know, which is a lot of what, if you want to reproduce, like what leaves look like or coastlines in a video game, you use these kind of algorithms. Uh, because they're very similar to how nature is, is creating things in geometries that are very rarely straight lines, right? There are no coastlines in the world that are straight lines. No. Because you know, they're all crooked, and then if you zoom in, you see there's little nooks and crannies underneath that. And, and the guy who, who came up with a lot of fractal stuff was a guy named Mandelbrot, and he said, if you ask the question, how long is the coastline, it really depends on what scale you measure it. So there's a lot of evidence that computation is going on in the physical world, even with, you know, natural things like coastlines and leaves and veins and arteries uh, based upon some informational template. So it's not as crazy as it sounds at first, but you're right, people do kind of look at you strange. And, and I've gotten all types, right? I've gotten, uh, you know, religious types that got really upset at me saying, this is not what the Bible says. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I look at it like this. Look, the, the Bible was rewritten a million times, um, you know, and it, a lot of it, a lot of religion to me is is mostly for to, to gain some, you know, monetary benefits for whoever is in charge of, of what it is. I, I'm not saying that there isn't a God or, or whatever God everybody believes in. Is, is, is not real or incorrect because, frankly, we don't know. Um, that's why I'm also willing to entertain that the simulation hypothesis is real is because I'm not dead. I don't know what happens, and I don't know if I'm going to get that answer when I die. But until then, I'd like to keep an open mind about everything that's going on in the universe and just assume that anything is possible. <laughs> right, yeah. And, you know, I, I've actually met and interviewed people that have had near-death experiences and, you know, they actually, you know, were dead for a little while. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they will tell some interesting stories. But one of the very common things, so there was a guy named Daniel Brinkley. He wrote a book called Saved by the Light back in the 90s, uh, whom I know. And he was struck by lightning and was dead for like 20 minutes, you know, back in the 70s. And one of the things that, that he so, said was that he saw what he calls a life review, where he had to go back over the things that he did in his life, but he, was, he called it a panoramic 360-degree life review. So he would see, like if he shot someone, he would see it from the point of view of the other person. And I said, wow. you know what, that sounds a lot like the virtual cameras that we used <laughs> in when I was earlier talking about how we record eSports games. Right? Sure. We put the virtual camera somewhere in the virtual world. You could actually be the other character, the character you're shooting. And so if, if that's what they say they saw... Somebody must have recorded it somewhere, right? Right. And and where is this recording? Uh, and it just sounds more and more like, you know, this idea of a virtual video game reality. So, so I mean, I agree with you. We should keep an open mind. I mean, I don't think we can rule out a lot of stuff. But there there is evidence that sometimes a lot of scientists will ignore that 
there are things going on in consciousness that we can't explain with a physical model of the universe, but these things start to make more sense when we think of it as a virtual or a computer generated world. Yeah. And I like, I remember my stepbrother, I don't know if I've ever told this story on the show before, um, but uh, my stepbrother was in a coma for a while, uh, like a really long time, uh, almost a month. They gave him like a 5% chance to live. And then uh, he ended up waking up and coming back to life essentially. Right. And in the room, uh, there were some family members in there, but then he was also pointing out, you know, maybe eight to 10 other relatives that were deceased that were not there. And he couldn't understand why no one else could see them in the room. And he was like, well, they're, you know, they're angels. Um, I, I don't understand why you can't see so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and he named it off clear as day. Like it was right. like they were all inside the room. So when you talk about, cause I, I, I've been fascinated with this for a while. When you talk about people who have died for, you know, a couple minutes or 30 seconds and then brought back to life or, or the guy you were talking about who was dead for 20 minutes, I wonder where it is, wh- where you are, where your mind is or where your, your spirit is during that time period when you're away and what causes you to see, like, like you were saying, the people in 360, um, you know. If, if you got shot and the other things like that, or, or relatives, because a lot of people bring up dead relatives as well. I wonder what that is. Yeah, you're right. And a lot of people do bring up, you know, relatives that die. And sometimes people will see in dreams, you know, the moment somebody dies, they'll see a relative in a dream that night, uh, even though that person might be halfway across the world. And, and I find that when you think about lots of these unexplained phenomena, that if you think of the world as, as a simulation, rather than a physical world, and that consciousness can be downloaded or uploaded. I mean, one of the popular topics in Silicon Valley these days is, can we download our consciousness to a silicon device, and can we leave it there? But, you know, the religions have been telling us all along that our consciousness gets downloaded into the physical body, and it gets uploaded out of it. So it's a kind of wave of information. And then where does that go, and what gets rendered? Uh, You know, different people can see different things, uh, because in a video game, like if you and I are playing and we're in the same scene, uh, there's no shared rendering of that scene. That My computer is rendering it and your computer is rendering it. And this is a trick we use in video games all the time. We would send information to one player, but not to another player. Like depending on their level, we might, you know, they could see something in a scene and the other guy can't see it. Well, it just wouldn't be rendered on their, their laptop uh, for the guy that couldn't see it. So this idea of being able to see things that aren't there uh, you know, and, and even quantum physics is starting to recognize that there may not be just one reality. There was an uh, article in MIT Technology Review about a physics experiment done where they had like six entangled particles and one guy was looking at it in one place and another guy was looking at them somewhere else. And it was proposed by a physicist called Wigner years ago, but they couldn't do the experiment back then. And they found, they saw a different set of quantum probabilities. So it was almost like two observers were observing slightly different realities with the same set of particles. And so now they're kind of scientifically proven that we may be seeing slightly different things. But but I think in your example, the dead relatives, it gets back to these are players who are being communicated. They're communicating with the character in the game. That would be one possible explanation for how that works, you know? Yeah, it's uh it's look again it's so much to wrap your mind around that you're like wow. Um I I like I could be high at one of those Silicon Valley parties. Have you gone to any of those by the way? To which parties? Yeah, you know the crazy like microdosing parties and like the sex parties out in Silicon Valley. You know- I've heard of those, but no, I haven't been to one of those. <laughs> you know, I uh, I get the sense that there's is a, a lot of uh, younger people in their twenties that. <laughs> oh, gotcha, gotcha. Because I, I didn't having, like I had heard, yeah. you know, I'd heard Elon Musk and those guys had gone, and uh, and it, it was kind of a place to, you know, uh, microdosing acid has become popular again. Um, you know, yeah. much like it was in the '60s. And uh, one of the things that they sit around and talk about is these possible uh, hypotheses and. Uh, you know, other beings and, uh, are we here alone and all that other stuff. And I, I'd, I'd wondered if you'd, you'd ever gone to anything like that and discuss this with people. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, but certainly had those discussions with people here, but, <laughs> but, but, so, but sober and, 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 and clothed is what you're saying. Yeah. In a sober environment. <laughs> now they're, uh, you know, what I like about the simulation hypothesis is that 
you can have discussions of things that people used to only have when they're high. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you can, and there's serious <laughs> academics and scientists who are willing to discuss it and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I read your book sober, which is, which is a first for me. Um, no, but it, <laughs> again, it, it's so fascinating and you're right. Like these are things like in the sixties, you're like, man, this, this would be a book written on acid. Um, today it's not, you know, this is a, a real possibility. Um, you're an esteemed scientist and, uh, and it's a crazy thing. Uh, one more big question here before we, before we shift into a, a couple other things you do, because you're one of the most fascinating people I think on the planet is, um, if, if all of this is real and you know, you're living in a simulation, right? What's, what's to stop people who are living miserable lives from killing themselves? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I get asked that question and the related question is, so, you know, why not just kill other people, right? If it's just a video game. Right. Um, you know, there's no consequences. And we're not saying, by saying that it's a simulated reality, we're not saying there aren't any consequences. Uh, I mean, if you're playing a video game, it's pretty important to understand what are the rules of that game and what are the goals of your character in that game. Right? In, in a game like CSGO, you are trying to shoot and kill other players. That's the point of the game. A, a lot of games are like that, obviously. Yeah, a lot of games are like that. But in The Sims, right, that's not necessarily the point. And you're not going to get points for <laughs> right. doing that. Uh, and so it really depends on the nature of the simulation. Now, you know, we can't say for 100% certainty what the point is. Some people say, well, is it a simulation to figure out if we're going to destroy ourselves uh, as a civilization or if we're going to destroy the planet or something completely different. Um, so as part of my research for this book, you know, one of uh, the people that I interviewed was uh, Tessa B. Dick, who was uh, the wife of Philip K. Dick, mm-hmm. you know, the science fiction writer. And you know, his work has gotten immensely popular uh, you know, after he died in, in 82, like Blade Runner and uh, uh, The Man in the High Castle. Well, all, all of this stuff is starting to come true, essentially, it feels like. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. And so when I asked her, you know, about what would he think about this idea. And, and she said, yeah, I mean, he believed that the Matrix was closer to reality than not. And he actually remembered other timelines. So, you know, he had a speech in 1977 where he said, we're in a computer-generated reality, and people are tweaking the parameters and changing things. And the only clue we have that something has changed is sometimes we'll have a feeling of deja vu or we'll remember something from the other timeline. He, uh, he wrote a book, a uh, story called uh, The Adjustment Team, which was made into a movie with Matt Damon a few years ago, The Adjustment Bureau. Yeah. But in the original story, a guy stumbles into the office and he finds that everybody's frozen and that there's some adjusters there who are changing people's memories and moving things around. Uh, and you know, he felt that that had actually happened to him. And according to his wife, he remembered a timeline where the Axis powers... Germany and Japan won World War II. And he remembered our timeline where, you know, obviously the Allies won World War II. And he said that whoever was running the simulation would rewound the simulation and then reran it to see if they would get different results. And that that's part of the, the simulation. Whoever's running it is they would change the simulation. I mean, he said he, he they told him they would try to avoid the assassination of JFK. Uh, in Dallas, but every time they changed the simulation, he would get assassinated somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So eventually they gave up. <laughs> or it led to undesirable results, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which they di- didn't want. So, I mean, it's a big question as to what the purpose and goals are of the simulation. But, uh, you know, there's another MIT professor, um, uh, Max Tegmark, who's a physicist, and he was asked about this, and he goes, well, just make your life interesting so the simulators don't shut you down, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I'm, I, that's what I'm trying to do every day, at least. That's what I'm telling myself. Hey, if, if you're interesting enough for us, you're just going to live forever, which is not true. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you download yourself to a silicon device, right? <laughs> I know, or, or you chop your own head off like Walt Disney, you know, and just keep it, keep it frozen and then bring yourself back. Here's the thing, though. I don't want to bring back an old head of myself. I want, like, I want the younger, like, sweet version of myself, not the old right. head. Right. Chopped off. You want a, uh, an avatar that's healthy and <laughs> yeah, young yeah. and vibrant and like able to do stuff. Uh, since you were talking about uh, movies a second ago, I, I want to dip into this part of your career because next to the fact that you're uh, an MIT uh, scientist, um, you build video games. Like you're an unbelievable entrepreneur. You also produce movies, which no one would guess that in a million years. Uh, yeah, you know, it's been uh, kind of a hobby of mine. I'm a big fan of all kinds of movies, and uh, 
you know, I, it, in Silicon Valley and, and in Cambridge, you know, I split my time kind of between uh, the East Coast and West Coast. Uh, you know, I started to be an angel investor in, in startups, and startups are pretty risky. You can lose all your money. Yeah. And, you know, I, every now and then I would talk to an investor about a movie and investing in a movie, and they'd be like, oh, we don't want to invest in movies. Movies are too risky. Yeah, they are. I'm like, well, 90% of startups fail, and you invest in startups. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty pretty risky, too. But so I started to, to you know, meet some filmmakers uh, and uh, got involved in, in being a producer in, in a number of independent films. You know, one of them was one of the first films shot on the Navajo Reservation. It was kind of a small film. These tend to be smaller budget films. I mean, of I, I tend not to be involved in Avengers, yeah. <laughs> Endgame. Those I like to just go watch. Right? That's, Ex- exactly. Uh, well, <laughs> and, and the reason why I bring this up, so here's where our paths cross. Um, I, I don't know if you know, I'm a, I'm a big film guy. So I've I've had a production company for about 11 years. I've done... In my career, probably 30 films, something like that. Um, and I do small budget crazy movies as well. There was a movie you did called Osambi that I read about on IMDb. Do you remember that one? Yes, that's right, yeah. Yep. There was a group of guys in Utah who were making fantasy and science fiction films. They actually have a show on the CW now that I'm helping them produce uh, called The Outpost. <laughs> oh, but really? Yeah, that was... Yeah, that was one of the one of the movies that those guys had created, and yeah, I tend to be involved more on the business side and not so much in the actual. Filming. Oh, of course, of, of course, yeah. Because look, we have investors from all walks of life, and that's that's also part of the fun part about it. Because a lot of people get into it just because they love movies and and are trying to help young filmmakers, and it's amazing. The independent film business cannot survive without people investing in movies. Um, but Osambi in particular that year, and I don't know how how deep you are into movies and how much you enjoy them. I had a movie come out that year called FDR American Badass. And I, I, I don't know if you know that film. You know, I've heard the name. I, I haven't seen it, but so, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of being in the indie film world, I remember hearing about it. Yeah, and what happened was with Osambi, it came out the same year, and the Osambi trailer blew up, and it went viral, and so did FDR American Badass. So that at the end of the year, on all of the you know film review sites of like the craziest movies of the year, Osambi was on there. So when I went to do research on you and I looked you up, I was like, oh my God, dude, I, I had no idea you were into, you know, the, the movie business or anything whatsoever. And then, then when I saw you did Osambi, I was like, man, this guy's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a whole fun set of movies that, uh, you know, that I got involved with. I mean, I, I tend to, to get involved in the kind of films that I like to watch, which are like sci-fi, fantasy, or documentaries about weird subjects. Yeah, because uh, that's this, cool. Yeah, this was about a bringing what Osama bin Laden was a uh, was a zombie, and that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was like shooting zombies, kind of like a cross between uh, I don't know, World War Z and uh, you know. Uh, 9-11 or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and FDR American Badass was about Roosevelt who got polio from a werewolf and all of the axis of evil was uh, was werewolves. So like, um, you oh, know. That's great. I'll have to watch that. Oh, one. yeah, yeah. That and, and it was like, you know, it was a, a wink wink of like, I did a series of movies making fun of like, you know, B movies from the 70s. So everybody's yep. in on the joke and, and the, you know, the the costumes are terrible and all that stuff. Uh, there's there's <laughs> continuity errors on purpose. And yep. uh, our, yep. those, our, our two films were, were linked together. And I remember watching the trailer and I was like, oh, man, there's, there's a group of dudes who get it. Uh, just about having fun. Because like, movies like that are fun and you, know, uh, you yeah. never take them yeah. too seriously. Uh, well, yeah, and that's important, I think. For those. And I'm a big fan of the old Ed Wood movies. You know? <laughs> same, same. And that, I, I did a series of those for, man, like the last uh, five years, kind of in that vein. Uh, just because I missed it. They don't exist anymore. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that there's another person out in the world who enjoys that as well. Uh, where do you go from here a- a- afterwards? Um, are, are you still working on you know video games, obviously? One of them's got like 29 million downloads. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I had a couple of video game companies that got a lot of downloads. I mean, these days I tend to be more an investor or advisor to helping video game companies. And that's part of what I do at MIT is we run a, a startup program for people who want to build video game companies. Um, and uh, so I'm continuing to do that in the esports and AI world, and I'm going to be writing uh, more books. You know, I'm taking I took a little time off from that program this year so I could focus on my writing, and I have a startup book coming out next year as well. Um, and then you know we'll uh, I've been uh, trying to get a, uh, uh, a movie project off the ground that's based on another science fiction writer called uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. 
she she was a Hugo Nebula winning author, one of the first women in science fiction, and uh, we've been working on a an adaptation of one of her works as well. So, uh, and then I've got a site called Bitmovio, which uh, I'm a co-founder of, which is a place for independent filmmakers to basically find an audience for their film, and you know, it's, you, people can tip you and use virtual currency. It's using the model of video games, but in the in the independent film world. So okay. That's to what we've been what we've been talking about, and yeah, a lot of those uh, like the the low budget fantasy sci fi movies that that uh, you know I've been involved with it would be on there, and and it's a way for people to um, actually make money from their movies, which you know a lot of independent filmmakers don't do these days because distribution is. It's pretty tough. It uses crypto and blockchain under the hood. Yeah, spe- uh, especially with the – once they did away with DVDs, that's when it got bad because now everybody just wants to, wants to watch a movie on Netflix. And uh, I think – let's see, three movies ago, I did a crowdfunding one, and then I just gave it away for free um, to, to the right, fans. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that's what you know, I think a lot of uh, indie filmmakers kind of have to do to, to get – to get it out there, but you know, in in China and, and uh, in the in the East, there's a lot of sites where people will watch streamers and they'll they'll tip them with virtual goods and virtual currency, and so there's a whole new gamified model for people to pay for movies that's and, great. and uh, streams online, and that's what this site Bitmovio is all about, and and so we launched that in open beta a few a few weeks ago, so I'm keeping busy that way as well. That's awesome. Yeah, look, you're a, you're a hell of an author, man, and uh, I really really enjoy this book it was it's it was one of these things where i again i just stumbled across an article uh, about it bought the book and um it, it's amazing how many talented people like yourself are out in the world that just need a little bit of exposure where you're like oh man this guy's amazing i'm gonna reach i'm gonna reach out to him and hit him up about how amazing his book was so uh thank you for being on the show man and thank you for existing yeah. uh because we need more I, seriously we, we need more people like you out in the world who are willing to toss out theories and write books about things uh, knowing you're going to take heat from it because I'm sure the heat that you're taking you know against religion and everything else is is probably got to be a little uh, overwhelming uh, yeah there's definitely some of that out there but then there's a lot of people that have been supportive as well and uh, so yeah thanks for having me on and you know the book is the simulation hypothesis and hopefully people will uh, check it out and, and my website is called zenentrepreneur.com and there's a lot more information on the book there as well. Great. Um, where can people find you on social media? I, I, I found you through Facebook. I don't know if you're a big social media guy. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Facebook uh, and Twitter uh, as Riz Stanford. Okay. On, uh, and on Facebook, it as the same as my website, which is Zen Entrepreneur on, um, on Facebook. Awesome. Well, look, uh, kids, go out and buy the book, The Simulation Hypothesis. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, whether you believe in it or not, uh, it's nice to open up your mind and, and, and take a stab at it. After Look, after I was at Coachella for, for Hologram Tupac, so after that, anything is possible to me. So uh, th- thanks for being on the show, Riz. Yep, thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Riz Verk, man. What an awesome dude. How rad is that guy? Scientist, man. That, this is they're making a comeback ever since Einstein. They're becoming sexy now. Pick up the, the simulation hypothesis. Uh, this book is fantastic. Um, I love doing shows like this. I love meeting people from all walks of life and then just having them sit down. It's one of my favorite parts of doing a podcast in, in all seriousness that I get to meet and chat with people like this who let's face it. I would never get to come across someone like this in real life, but on a podcast I can, and we can sit and chat for an hour. Uh, no matter if you believe in it or don't, you don't believe in it either way. It's, it's fun to chat about different theories and different hypotheses that are floating around out, out in the world that you're like, man, I wonder, I wonder if this is real. Um, Jesse can't even wrap her mind around this. She, she couldn't be here today. But uh, I love doing shows like this. Um, I hope to expand and do many, many more shows like this. Uh, it was a blast. And uh, to Riz out there, thank you for being on the show. We greatly appreciate it. I am Ross Patterson. This is The Revolution. Good night, everyone. <laughs>